Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you. When Louisa and I, my wife Louisa and I, when we were uh, going out before we were married, uh, I happened to have glandular fever, and uh, Louisa had her birthday. And I remember on the date of her birthday, I, I rested the entire day because I wanted to be on my best form possible to celebrate her dinner in the evening. Now, I'm, I'm not sure that my best form was, was that great form, uh, but I'm really glad that I, I got myself ready uh, for the party. And uh, then a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to a party with 30 people, not 13, but 3 zero. I know. And I, I sort of thought, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I know how to act at a party. I'm not sure how I know how to talk to 30 people. Um, and uh, parties, particularly at the moment, they come with a question mark, don't they? And that's why we're calling this series a Party Time. Party Time? And uh, the second time uh, we see here in uh, Luke's Gospel, there's a, there's a question mark around uh, Jesus' own partying. Because the, the Pharisees, the religious class, they are interrogating uh, Jesus about his party habits. And the Pharisees say to Jesus in verse 33, they say, uh, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. God's coming, look busy. God's coming, look serious. That's the, the, the message that they're trying to say to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, why so serious? Because look at, look at verse 34. We see Jesus, he answered, uh, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? And Jesus is saying, this party that I'm inviting you to, it's, it's like a wedding, and I'm the bridegroom. I'm at the center of this party. So I say what this party is like, not you. A few uh, weeks ago, a, a friend told me that she'd been invited to a wedding. And uh, during the service, the, the wedding had lots of silence, uh, lots of seriousness. It, it felt very odd. It felt really uh, weird. No one knew if they were allowed to smile at any particular point <laughs> during uh, the service. And although a lot of us have enjoyed uh, these smaller weddings that have been taking place over, over the last year or so, here the, the rules, they'd, they'd taken the, the fun out of the feasting. The, the, the guests, they didn't know how to celebrate. And Jesus doesn't throw parties like that. Jesus, he is not a party pooper. We, we see that Jesus, he goes on in verse 35, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. Now we know that Jesus, he is down with uh, praying and uh, fasting. Uh, he assumes that his followers, they will fast. But now is not the time. Pick your moment, Jesus is saying. The, 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 the purpose of fasting is, is waiting for the coming kingdom. But we're in Luke chapter 5, and in, in the previous chapter, in Luke chapter 4, we see in verse 21 that Jesus, he stands up in the temple, he, he reads from uh, Isaiah's scroll, and he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus, he is the king of the coming kingdom, that kingdom is here. And, and what we see is Jesus, he's, he's bringing to fruition the, the ancient purposes of God, forgiveness of sins, and the coming of his kingdom. So Jesus, he's saying, what are you waiting for? And when he says uh, there, when he says, and when the bridegroom will be taken from them, Jesus, he's referring to the cross. Jesus is saying, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to pay for the sins of the world. So all that fasting, which up until now has all been about, it's all been about repenting, it's been about penitence, it's been about longing for the kingdom of God to come. Jesus is saying, I'm here, I'm here. And, and when I go to the cross, that will be the time yet again for fasting, for, for longing to God to come again. But now it's the time to party. And we live in this, we live in this tension, don't we? We live in the, the tension of the, the kingdom having come, but not having come completely. And so there, there will be times where we fast, but also there are times when we celebrate. So that's parable number one. Uh, parable uh, number two, uh, Luke writes in verse 36, Jesus uh, said this, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new one will not match the old. 
And so Jesus, he's saying, this, this new thing that's come, you can't just use it as a, as a patch. You're going to wreck both what is new and both what is old. So that's, that's easy enough to, to understand. But then comes parable number three, where Jesus says in verse 37, and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. Now, when I read this, I, I got really confused by this, because when we think of wine, we think of a bottle of wine. And at this point, the, the wine is ready. It's ready to pour. Now, I know uh, some of you with a little more of, of this going on, perhaps you've, you've laid the wine very, very carefully in a vintage, uh, vintage wine in, in just the perfect bottle in just the right conditions, just so. And then after quite a few years of very careful aging, you might, you might open it, probably decant it a couple of hours before pouring, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but, but whenever we have a bottle of wine, uh, whether it's new or old, it is, in essence, the finished product. It's already fermented. But to Jesus' listeners, when they think of wine, they think of wineskins. And wineskins are not only store wine, but they're a key part of the, of the fermenting process, which is what happens when, when the yeast, it reacts with the natural sugars in the wine, and they release carbon dioxide. And it's this, it's this really dynamic process that you see before your very eyes. And Jesus' listeners, they understood fermenting wine in wineskins. Just like lockdowners understand fermenting sourdough, maybe kombucha. And so what happens is, is, is maybe you've got a, a, a goat skin and you fill uh, this, this goat skin with wine. And then as the, as the wine ferments, it sort of re-stretches the skin. Now, now this uh, goat skin, it only has the capacity to do this once. If you try to put new wine into an already stretched out wineskin, the, 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 the skin no longer has the necessary give to, to accommodate and move all the gases that are being released. And so Jesus is saying nobody would ever do that. No one in their right mind would pour new wine into old wineskins. It's just a total disaster. And that's why he says in verse 37, not only will the wine be ruined, but the wineskins will be ruined. The whole thing will burst, and you'll just get wine everywhere. Not only will everything around you be covered in wine, it even won't even really be good quality wine at that, because it hasn't fermented uh, properly. And, and the gospel, this, this new wine, it is fermenting. It is bubbling, it is brimming with life. You can't just pour the gospel into any old vessel. So if I say, uh, God, here's my, here's my wineskin, here's the, the shape of my life. I've got my work, I've got my worldview, I've got my political party, I've got my finances, I've got my hobbies, I've got my idols, I've got my red lines. Now, Jesus, would you pour into my life and, and you fit into it? I hope there's enough room in there for you. No, Jesus, when he, when he pours into your life, he will not be shaped by you and me. He will not be shaped by the world. Jesus, he will not be forced and squeezed into a different shape. But Jesus, he comes to reshape the vessel that he's in. And Jesus, he wants to reshape your life and my life. So we've got a problem. We've got a problem, because not only do we need new wine, but we also need new wineskins. Like Jesus was saying, you, you can't patch up a garment with, with mismatching cloths. The, the main garment has to match. And Jesus, he uses the same a Greek word that you'd use for a symphony. You need the same key, you need the same conductor. A patchwork Christianity doesn't work. The vessel, it, it needs integrity. And if you've just got an, an old wineskin, you can't pour a new wine in, can you? It'll, it'll just burst. So, so perhaps you'll just be trying to pour in some kind of lifeless grape, grape juice into your vessel. You know, it won't change you. It won't change anyone else. It won't bring any joy to your life or, or any power 
to anyone. Or if you do pour the, the gospel in, your vessel will explode. We expect the, the Holy Spirit without holiness. We expect the power of God, but without godliness. Or, or a form of godliness, but we deny the power of God. You know, lovely looking wineskins, but in reality, there's nothing there. What we need is not only new wine, but new wine skins. Now, new wine uh, wasn't new information to God's people. Uh, wine throughout the Old Testament, it's a significant sign for, for sacred festivals, such as, as Passover and atonement. So it's this symbol of salvation. Wine was even used in sacrifice as well. And uh, more practically, wine is, is not just a, a luxury, but it's essential. Or, you know, when the water's no good, then wine becomes very, very important, becomes an essential life source. And then not only did the, the prophets prophesy about new wine dripping from the mountains, but they also prophesied about us being given new hearts. This is so much bigger than a belief system or a behavior system. This is about a new heart. You and I, what we need is not a new moral code. What we need is a new heart to contain all that God has for you, ready to be enlarged and stretched and to grow. I recently spoke to, to someone who arrived in this country uh, as a refugee from Angola. And the stories she told me, they sent shivers down my spine. And uh, she, she said to me that she's noticed that there's a lot of activism today. And a lot of people getting very angry. Now, now obviously, activism and righteous anger can be a really essential thing. Thank God for it. But there's also a lot of activism today that reminds you of the Pharisees, isn't there? Or often more, more subtle, the sort of judgmentalism that we heard about last week. You know, that thought, oh, at least I'm not like them. Or just the, the, the frustration that we have about things out there. And, and this woman, she said to me, uh, it's much, much harder. It's much harder to work on yourself. And so when we, when we blame the world, we blame the world when we're stroppy or we're demotivated or we're self-pitying or, or whatever it may be. But she felt that she couldn't use the excuses of the things that had happened to her. That was her choice. Now, please don't make the mistake this morning of, of holding these parables at arm's length because you think it's for other people or it's for some other system or some other structure. No, primarily, these parables, they are about our hearts. The change that we want to see in the world today, it starts with us. And this woman was right. It is much harder to work on yourself. It's extremely hard. And willpower will only get you so far. It's much better, much more effective to surrender to the Holy Spirit. So we can, we can have our hearts softened by the Holy Spirit and flexible, just like those new wineskins. Paul says that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. A new creation has come. And this is what we all need. But so often we... We live as if we are an old creation, maybe letting old wine shape you and, and wear you down, and so you get used to it. Maybe it's, it's apathy or a, a skepticism or just whatever it is that is, is preoccupying your heart, an accumulation of all the relentlessness and the busyness of, of life, all the stuff, just, just filling all the available space. But the gospel is, is not secondary, it's not tertiary, it's primary or it's nothing. 
The gospel needs to shape your heart and my heart. It needs to shape all our ideas and all our ideals. We each need to accept by faith this, this gift of new wine and this gift of a new wine skin. And let this new wine push into every nook and every cranny of our lives and to reshape us. I also wonder if, if for, for many of us, the, 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 the reason that we're settling for less is because of what we may have experienced before in our lives. It's like we see in verse 39. We might be thinking, well, I rather like my old wineskin. Thank you very much. And I like my old wine. It's vintage wine. It's the best wine after all. Now, Jesus, he's not saying to sort of reject the old wineskins as a blanket rule. And if there's wine there, then then great. If If the presence of God is there, then great. But if there's no wine left, we, we honor the past, but we're, we're not contained by it. Jesus, he, he wasn't contained by the past, was he? Again, we see in, in the chapter before Luke 5, in Luke 4, uh, verse 16, Luke, he writes that it was Jesus' custom to go into the synagogue all the time. And Jesus, he, he respected and he lived with the old wineskins. But we also see in that passage that in returning with the power of the Holy Spirit, as he stood up to proclaim the kingdom of God, he had this wineskin that was about to burst with an abundance of new life. R.T. Kendall says that sometimes the greatest opposition to what God wants to do next comes from those who are on the cutting edge of what God did last. So don't, don't, don't get rid of the old of what Jesus has done in your life. But nostalgia, nostalgia is not going to usher in the kingdom of God. Celebrate the past. Celebrate the past if there's, if there's wine there, but be ready for God to do the new thing in your life. We must stay soft to Jesus. We must stay soft to him and ready to receive from him. We have to keep seeking the Holy Spirit to enable us to stay soft to him. So I wonder, where is your expectation for this party? Are you you bothering to RSVP? Maybe for you there's a question mark that you're placing on this particular party. You're a bit unsure, a bit unsure like, at those parties that I was speaking about. You know, I'm fine without new wine. And yet the, the, the new wine and the new wineskins, they're so important. They're so central to, to Jesus' message that they're in every single gospel. They're in every single gospel, all of them except for one, except for John's gospel, where Jesus doesn't say it, he does it. And what we see is that Jesus' first miracle is turning water into wine at a wedding. That's what he prioritizes. First things first with Jesus Christ. Whether the new wine is far better than the old. And the new wine is overflowing. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. Overflowing with joy, overflowing with new wine. And Jesus, in his words and in his actions, he is saying that the new wine has come. So, where are we living? Where are we living as if the kingdom hasn't come? Where are we living where we've forgotten the purpose of our faith? Where are we living where we're not brimming with life, brimming, brimming with the joy of our salvation? I know it's tough out there. But I wonder, I wonder what season of your life you are in right now. Are you feasting? Are you fasting? When Jesus spoke here, they were in the time of Jesus having come, but having not yet gone to the cross. But you and I, we, li- we live on, on this side of the cross and the resurrection. And we live in the age of the Holy Spirit. 
So whatever it else may be going on in your life right now, that is the season that you and I are in. We live in the age of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is this new wine for us to receive. And maybe for you right now, you're wondering, am I supposed to be fasting? Well, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit and he will reveal to you gently and softly if it's the right time for you to be fasting, to be ushering in more of the kingdom. Bishop Leslie Newbigin, he said that the, the local church congregation, that's us. The local church, we are to be a sign We are to be an instrument and a foretaste of God's redeeming grace for the whole of society. In other words, the the kingdom. That, That the kingdom of heaven may come in Clapham as it is in heaven. So I wonder, what what do people see when they see us? What do we point them to? What's the sign? Is it wine? Is it joy? And are we doing what we say on the tin? Is your instrument, is your, is your vessel bringing Jesus to people, bringing the kingdom of, of heaven to people? And what do they taste? Do they taste the new wine? Do they taste and see that the Lord is good and that his priority is your joy, is your eternal joy because he has come to die for your sins. Each of us has a vessel. Each of us has a wineskin. And what's essential to these vessels? What's essential to our wineskins? Well, the purpose of a vessel is to contain wine. We see here that these vessels, they are, the purpose there is to provide the right conditions for that wine to ferment. But at the end of the day, having that vessel is is only worth having if people get to receive that wine, if if people get it. In other words, the the process is this. You you let the Holy Spirit pour into your life. You, you, You allow God, by his Holy Spirit, to ferment to, to change you from the inside out. And then you pour out so that others may receive. Receive, ferment, pour out. Receive, ferment, pour out. Because where there is new wine, there is new freedom, and there is new power, and the kingdom is here. Will you receive all this, if only you will surrender to Jesus Christ. Not a, not a patchwork Christianity, but saying, Jesus, would you give me a new wineskin? Because there is new wine coming to you to, to fill up your life and to be poured out of you. Are you ready?